Good morning. It's good seeing so many of you out this morning, especially uh, it's actually starting to look a little bit more like a normal gathering. So uh, appreciate uh, each and every one of you. And again, on, on behalf of me, and I would like to say the entire congregation, we do appreciate everyone being cooperative and uh, adjusting to these changes. Um, again, we hope and we pray and we pray that it is temporary and we'll get through this and it'll be grand scheme of things is a blip on the radar. So thank you for just paying attention, keeping the distance. And uh, to repeat what the elders said, again, as we continue to get a little bit more crowded, uh, face masks might make you feel more comfortable. Um, and it's definitely recommended or suggested as we get uh, more crowded. So as we're still trying to keep uh, distance and follow those guidelines. So anyway, if you want to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 this morning, that's where we're going to start. We're returning once again to our theme of this year, and that is the one another Christianity. Um, we've been focusing on several of those different aspects as an area which we can grow as a congregation, as we can grow into individuals. As Christianity is relational. It's, you have your vertical relationships and you have your horizontal relationships. We have a relationship with God the Father, the, the salvation relationship, and then by the grace of that, we have the horizontal relationships with each other in a congregation and our families uh, and, and so forth like that. And so all that requires one another's. In fact, you can go through your New Testament and find quite a number of them. And this morning we want to tackle one called, we find in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, where Paul says there, submit to one another in the fear of Christ, or New American Standard says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, or as I like the New King James, uh, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so we do want to focus on that, more, on that this morning and figure out what does that mean, what does the Bible actually mean when it says submit, you know, what, what is at the heart of submission and what are some practical ways you and I can better submit to one another. So first of all, what do you mean by submit? Because that's, to be honest, it's a dirty word in our, in our society today. Uh, we don't like this idea of submission. Uh, much like the Jews in the first century where Jesus says, if you practice sin, you're a slave to sin, they respond to him, we've never been a slave to anyone. First of all, how ignorant do you have to be of your own history? You know, some 400 years in Egypt they were slaves. But secondly, that, that knee-jerk reaction is, no, we're a free people. I, I'm, I do not submit to anyone. I'm not a slave to anything. And Jesus probably would have said, in my guess, how blind you are. And he said as much actually following that text. Now, if you were to just Google, define submit or submission, first definition would pop up. The act or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or the will or authority of another person. Very violent definition. Really. It's if you're submitting, you're the weaker one. You're yielding, you're subjecting yourself, you're, you're yielding to that higher or more powerful force, will or authority. Um, and so... By default, I think I, I would it'd be a fair statement to say that's kind of the default understanding we have when we think of words like submission. Case in point, if we talk about God's plan for the home, husband, wives would be subject to their husbands. Or we talk about God's plan for the church, that we are to be subject to those who have authority over us, the elders. But mainly the home part. How quickly do the knees jerk in our society when it comes to that teaching? And I believe it's in part because we have this idea of submission. Somehow submission means you're weak, you're inferior, you don't have a backbone, and so you, you, by default it's, it's, it's a thing that we don't want. The question is, is that actually the way the Bible uses the word submit, submission, or those synonyms? Now, if you look in the text, in Ephesians 5, 21, the Greek word there is hup uh, hupotasso. And again, that hupo was under. And, and really, it's primarily a military term originally. The idea was to rank under, to be put in subjection or to subject. Uh, Strong's words it as, originally it was a military term 
meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion underneath the command of a leader. So it's a military term. Now, this is not unfamiliar in the Bible. Jesus, uh, when he signed the centurion, and the centurion says, I said to my serp, as I know you're one in authority as I am, and if you command, if I say to my troops, jump, they jump. If I tell them to go here, they go there. So you, if you just command that my servant be live, he'll live. So the Bible's not a stranger to these military terms. However, Paul's not using it in the military sense here. The non-military usage it was a voluntary attitude of giving in cooperation, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. And I want to, again, maybe I can talk to the others about putting my pulpit out further so I can point at things. But note that it was a voluntary attitude. Not a, by force, I have to yield to the superior authority, I'm being subjugated into this. It was a voluntary, mutual yielding. And when the Bible talks about submission, this is the same word that is used of Jesus when he submitted to the will of the Father. It's used of the Holy Spirit in reference to the other persons of the Godhead. It's used of Christians to each other. There should be this attitude of mutual submission in a congregation. I remember talking to Brett one time about this and uh, about the relationship that other elders have with each other. I'm not sure we, I, I ever thought of it this way. Maybe you have. But when you think of that, the elders are the shepherds or overseers of a local congregation. And in the hierarchy of things, yes, we as members of just Christians are not in the position. We have the obligation to submit to them, you know, barring that it's not violating the word of God. We trust that as they are following the instructions in Scripture, not lording over, having the best interest, shepherding. They've taken this position not lightly. But the question comes in, what happens if an other elder needs shepherding? And Brett maybe remembers this, but I remember him saying, well, really, in that case in point, I still, as an elder, have to submit to the other elders, he said, and vice versa. There's a mutual submission even amongst a leadership. And at the end of the day, on the very base level, we are all Christians first. And this idea of submission to each other permeates the New Testament. You know, I'm reminded with the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 34 and 35. In Mark chapter 9, verses 34 and 35. This is when Jesus is foretelling his death and resurrection, and as often what happened is the disciples, some of them wanted to be great, wanted to put themselves first. There was a little debate who would be the chief among them. And Jesus... Well, the text reads here, but they kept silent, for on the way they had discussion about which, uh, with one another, of which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all, and a servant of all. He'll submit himself to service. He'll submit his will to the others. And when we think about, when we go forward talking about these things, submission really is all about becoming last in order to become first. It's about putting the needs of others before self. It's considering my brother's perspective, his attitude, where he's coming from or she's coming from, what she may or he may be dealing with. And really, when we, we're going to see specifically in Romans chapter 14 towards the end of this lesson, but really, when it comes to matters of conscience and opinions, submission is absolutely necessary. And so, going forward, we need to, ask, we need to make, make the point that love, as we've talked about so often this year in these One Another series, is at the heart of every one in our statement. And it's at the heart of mutual submission in Christ. And that's what it comes down to biblically. I mean, if you consider the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, we're not going to read the whole chunk there, but I think many of us could quote it from memory. Love is patient, love is kind. But he says in verse 5, 
Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love does not seek its own. Love would rather yield to others for their well-being than assert their own personal privileges. And perhaps this is going to have a un, an unequal weight in the lesson, but when we think about submission, this is probably one of the more difficult one in our statements in the Bible for us. Because we live in a culture of individual rights. We love our individual rights. And yes, I thank God that in his wisdom, and as, it, as he says in the book of Acts, he has appointed the times and places of our habitation that all might reach and grope for him. I'm glad he has chosen that I get to live in a free society where I am endowed by him with certain unalienable rights that are enshrined in the Bill of Rights. I am. But like all good things, they can get to a point where they become idolatrous, where they become harmful to Christians. And so when we, when we live in a culture that is so fixated on individual liberty, we need to be careful that our liberty does not cause my non-submission to my brothers and sisters in Christ, that I put self before the cause of Christ. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul makes a similar point. Starting in verse 9, we'll read through the ninth chapter in verse 2. No, it's not that long of a reading, but 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting verse 9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, you have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple. Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For th through your knowledge, he, is who, he is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and, one, and wounding their conscience when he is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I may not cause my brother to stumble. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Now Paul will continue on to defend. He's making the point. He says, I have all these rights. I have all these individual liberties as an apostle. He'll go on later in chapter 9 to talk about he had every right to demand compensation and support for his preaching from the Corinthian brethren. But he chose not to so that they might be better off. That they would have the funds to take care of their own, also that they would somehow not feel indebted or any other way, that they would learn self-sufficiency. He did it for their well-being. And in the context of chapter 8, what he's talking about is, there's an issue with meat being sacrificed to idols in Corinth. Some Christians understood that these idols are nothing. They're wood, they're stone, they're, they're fake. And so they had no problem going to the market and buying meat, and the guy might say, well, it's sacrificed to, you know, Aphrodite or something. And some Christians are like, okay, whatever. It's just wood. Others, however, were seriously conflicted about that. Like, we shouldn't have anything to do with idols. Like, you know, they're younger. They're, they're coming out of idolatry. So like, I can't do that. And Paul's saying, you may have the knowledge and the liberty to go eat wherever. But don't let your liberty become a stumbling block for your brethren. And he can't gives a case in point. What if a new convert sees you going into the idol's temple to eat? What will they think? How is their conscience going to be affected? And he even says in the text, verse 11, for through your knowledge he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when he is weak, you sin against Christ. This is where I said it gets difficult. And if any of you are uncomfortable in the audience, don't worry. I was uncomfortable when I was studying through this. The gospel is supposed to be uncomfortable at times. It's okay. But if this hits close to home, it's probably because for all of us, there's something to hit home to and something that needs to change or we need to think about. 
Again, as I said, I love the individual li liberties I have. But I should not hold on to them so tightly that they become a stumbling block for my brethren. That shows the opposite of mutual submission. You know, the illustration here, perhaps, would help us understand this a little bit better. There's a story of a preacher named Tom Erickson. The public library had a dial-a-story system. The kids could dial the library and they'll read them three little pigs or something. But the man's phone number was only one digit off from the library's number. And so he routinely got four and five-year-olds calling his residence asking to hear about three little pigs and, you know, the bears and all that stuff. And after getting red in the face trying to explain to toddlers, essentially, that you got the wrong number, what do you think he did? Now, if you and I, we might change our number or call those residents back and say, hey, I'm not the right number. You need to stop, have your kids stop calling me. No, what he did was he went out and bought the three little pigs. And he sat by his phone. And whenever a kid would call, he would read the story. Instead of asserting his individual rights to perhaps do what you and I would have done, call the phone company, change your number, complain to the library, all this other stuff. He said, no, it's, I, I'd rather give up a little bit of my free time if it means the difference for a child. And really, that's what it comes down to when it comes to submission. I have the right or the liberty to do X. But if it means for the betterment of my brethren, I will forego X in order to strengthen them. And Paul gives the example of the thing sacrificed to idols. He said, I would forego eating meat the rest of my life if it meant the betterment of my brethren. And again, this is the difficult part because, again, we do love our individual liberty. We do. But the need to love my neighbor, the need to love my brethren never goes away. Individual liberties come and go, but the obligation to my brethren is eternal. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, starting in verse 34. Jesus says here, or the text reads, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the great commandment of, in the law? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. You know, I heard one time an older Christian tell a new convert, here are the three things you need to know to be a successful, healthy Christian. Love God, love your neighbor, do good. And that's, you think it can't be that simple. Well, if you love God, you're going to want to do his will. So that requires time in the word. If you love your neighbor, it's a, that's an outpouring of the love of God because you are being transformed by his word. And doing good is putting the word of God to practice and doing good to your neighbor. Now, I think we understand these principles when it comes to parents. Parents give up a great many things for their children. I don't speak from personal experience, but according to my mom and dad, there was a laundry list of things they gave up for our betterment. Free time, money, all of it. We were involved in every extracurricular you could think of. And we even enlisted my grandmother at times to help with that. So, but we understand that. The giving up of perhaps individual liberties for the betterment of my brethren. Now, how, do, how can I better submit to my brethren? How can I sum, better submit to one another? We understand that the core of submission is love. And yes, it at times may require us to do difficult things, like giving up beloved personal liberty in Christ for their betterment. But how can I do that better? Now, I'm not going to attempt to spell out specific examples, list out every single way. I think what might be a better approach is I'm going to give us three principles that should guide us when it comes to or help us understand submission to each other better. And if these are work for you, great. 
I succeeded. If not, lesson learned, I'll start spelling out specifics next, next week. Uh, but submission begins with the right attitude. In Philippians chapter 2, starting verse 4, I know, I, I keep going back to Philippians. I do apologize. Well, no, I don't. <laughs> I know we spent nearly a month and a half in Philippians, but it's such a practical book, and we just keep coming back to it. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 4, Paul writes here, it says, Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which also existed in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, if you want to talk about somebody who had every single right to not do what he did, it's Jesus. God in his divine justice had every single right just to end it all there. No redemption, none of that. We were all, and outside of Christ, we still are, the objects of God's just and holy wrath. That's a biblical truth. But Jesus submitted to the perfect will of the Father. He gave up his own rights for the betterment not only of the humans living there in that time and place, but all the trillions who would come after him. Not for the guarantee that they would become Christians, but for the chance. Again, that's best summarized by Paul in Romans chapter 5. That God demonstrated his own love for us, that he, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were his enemies. And so if Christ was willing to submit himself, to give up that kind of liberty for the betterment of the creation for the betterment of those who spat and mocked him, for the well-being of the centurion who lashed him and ripped off his robe and beat him. What is a small sacrifice on our part for our brethren? What is a teeny little Saturday afternoon in service for my brother compared to what Christ did for us. But it begins with that type of attitude. Paul says, have this attitude which was also in Christ Jesus. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but that also those of your brothers and sisters. Actively looking to do good and actively looking for ways that you can mutually submit to one another. Now one application of this, and if you're tired of me using the illustrations of the current situation, well, just let me know. I may or may not stop. But the face mask, it's a piece of cloth. You may think it works. You may think it doesn't work. You know, I'm not here to convince you otherwise. I personally think the evidence is there that if something reduces my risk by 70%, I'm, I'm going to do that. It, it seems common sense. But you may not be of the opinion of that. However, if this piece of cloth makes my brethren feel more secure worshiping God, then it's a small thing for me to do. If it is as effective as some say, then it's definitely a small sacrifice I can do for the sake of my brethren. It's hot, it's humid, it's itchy at times. And I know I'm not wearing it now, but there's more than six feet between me and Thelma and everyone else in the front row, so... But it's a small sacrifice I can make and submit to my brethren for their betterment. Because at the end of the day, whether you think it works or it doesn't, what's it going to hurt? If it makes the brethren feel more secure when we come together and worship. Because what, are we here, what should be the attitude when we come together? It should be the focusing on God. We should feel this should be the most secure place that we know of. This should be the place where our anxieties melt away. Out there in the world, you have trouble. With your brethren, you have peace. Out in the world, you have slander and threats and persecutions and people thinking we're, we're the dumbest people on the planet for still assembling. 
And here we're united with the same love and devotion towards God. And so if this helps my brethren feel a little bit more secure worshiping God, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Again, I can't make that decision for you, but I think that's just one application of just Philippians 2 here. Now, secondly, it starts with the right attitude. It continues with discernment. I said we were going to come to Romans 14 and deal with these conscience issues ever so briefly. But in Romans chapter 14, starting verse 1, and we'll read a little bit here. Really, the issue in Romans 14, we, I think many of us know it's an issue of some Christians thought they should only eat vegetables. Others said, you know, you can eat everything. And there was some dissension and tension in the Roman church. And we think, well, this seems such a petty argument. Well, maybe it was, but the issue really wasn't whether or not you could eat meats or vegetables. There was a lack of love, and there was a lack of mutual submission in the Roman church. And that's what spawned this incident with the whole vegetables versus meat camp. Now you start in verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are we to pass judge, uh, to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for, he, for the Lord is able to make him to stand. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He observes a day, observes it to the Lord. He who eats does so for the Lord. He who gives thanks to God, and he who eats not, for the Lord he, for the Lord he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God." For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, we, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this, to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Jumping down to verse 18. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we pursue all things which make for peace and for the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil to the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do, any, to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves." Now, maybe the knee-jerk preacher response, I need to make the point. Romans 14 is not dealing with matters of doctrine or teaching. Romans 14 is not saying, well, if your brother you know, starts saying that baptism is, is an essential for salvation, then, well, you just accept him and don't pass judgment. Okay, scriptures are clear on that. But when it comes to, like, what to eat, we know we have knowledge that God has blessed all things, and all things for food or for our nourishment. But some might be driven to feel otherwise. I know of a Christian who is a vegan for moral reasons. Now, personally, I would hate to give up bacon, even though I know it's probably going to hasten my demise. But I respect that conscious decision. They did so morally. They believed it was wrong to harm animals or anything. And I can understand it. I may not agree with it, but I understand it. But that person's approved before God. Just as I'm approved before God if I eat delicious crackling bacon versus salad. Anyway, both were approved. Now, what does this have to do with submitting to one another? In the context, submission would be accepting the brother or sister who has those opinions without passing judgment. If it is an issue that arises in the congregation that really does not pertain to matters of salvation isn't worth fighting about. And the thing is, we understand this in our other relationships, in friendship, marriages, all this stuff. It's normally a phrase as pick your battles. Is this worth fighting over? Is this worth dividing over? Is this worth my time? You know, you start going through that. And expand this more broadly outward. We need to have discernment for when submission is needed. 
And as brothers and sisters of Christ, the congregation should be cultivating an attitude of mutual submission. And I think where we've been at, again, the some 70 years that this congregation has been in existence, that culture has been developed. But the thing is, it needs to continue to be developed. As Paul said in the Philippians, excel, excel still more. And so we need to be excelling still more. We need to pick our battles. We need to understand when is and when is not a time to submit. And I, th- I think if we're honest with ourselves, more often than not, we'll end up submitting. That, willingly, that willing agreement to voluntarily work, cooperate, And this happens, and this is the third principle as we kind of bring this to a close. Submission to one another is strengthened when we remind ourselves and reaffirm where we are going. We're all heading to heaven, right? I'm sure if I would ask you to raise your hands, everybody says, well, yes, that's where I want to go. I'll raise them twice. That's the goal. And so when we remind ourselves when conflicts arise or something that this is the goal, this is where we're heading, it can become very, very quickly we can start discerning, is this something worth fighting or dividing over? You know, you look in Hebrews chapter 12. Again, Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verses 1 and 2 there. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the races set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the goal, where we are heading. And when we can reaffirm when tensions arise or when conflicts emerge that we're on the same team and we're going to the same place, it becomes a lot easier to submit to one another. You know, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, kind of bringing this to a close, Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. I think that sums up what we've been talking about this morning. Act as free men, but do not let our liberty be a covering for evil. And Peter, yes, may, in the context, maybe using freedom as a covering for sin. Peter's dealing with Gnosticism, after all. But also, don't let our individual liberty become a covering for evil by making our brother stumble, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 8. No win. And, and as we said, I think more often than not, I think we'll find that submission is the right answer. And to cultivate that attitude... And really, the mutual submission is the mindset that we are all on the same side. We're working towards the same goal. And so, to maybe beat a dead horse. Do you think these are the dumbest things on the planet? Okay, that's fine. I'm going to just ask you to submit to the brethren and not make a stink about it. And if you think these work and you're getting frustrated with people not wearing them, again, same goes. That's fine, but submit to your brethren and don't make a stink about it. And this goes for any other conscience issues, matters of opinion, where it comes to whether or not we believe the elders made the right decision or not. If it's not outright violating scripture, if it's not causing you to sin, if you both are stand approved before God, as it says in Romans 14, the answer is to submit. And that mutual cooperation and bearing one another's burdens. We read earlier this lesson in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It talks about there how Jesus, even though he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. That he humbled himself to the point of death, death on a cross, that 
sinners, enemies of God, might obey the gospel. Yeah, that's a pretty hefty price for, well, in human terms, that'd be a bad investment. No guarantee on return, no guarantee on growth. A chance. But that's how great the love was for you and I. And that love still continues to this day. And if anyone is here this morning, and this whole pandemic's got you thinking about your own mortality and, and life and what really matters, make the right decision today. You know, Jesus is still calling. And Jesus made it very simple for us. He said in Mark 16, 16, the apostles preached in Acts 2 and verse 38 that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. And if you've been away from the faith, you haven't been walking as you should or you're coming home, we can restore you this morning with prayers of restoration. Or you're struggling spiritually. I think this is the right time for me to reemphasize that the invitation... The front bench is not a shameful place. It is never embarrassing or shameful when somebody comes forward. It here means that a child of God is being born, a child of God is returning home, or a child of God is seeking the strength that they need to keep pressing on towards the goal. So if you have a need this morning, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation.